Thank you very much for joining us for this introduction to the new Spark dataset structure. My name is Dr. Anita Bandrovsky, and I will be presenting part of this and along with Dr. Patel and Dr. Pilko. Thank you very much for this opportunity to tell you a little bit more about what's on the horizon for the Spark data structure. All right, so the remit of Spark is to improve the fairness or the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reuse or reusability of the Spark data sets. So the kinds of things that you've experienced certainly on the findability are things that uh, each data set we know has your DOI, your persistent identifier, it has some rich metadata around it, nice title, nice uh, description, is searchable and discoverable online, and this is the Spark through the Spark data portal. Accessibility really has things to do with standardized, the ability to use uh, some standardized protocols in terms of how data are stored, descriptions of the data that are, uh, that are ac accompanied by appropriate metadata, so your subjects and samples files, things like that make it more accessible. Interoperability really has to do so far, and this is all a work in progress, um, but it has to do with controlled vocabularies and then uh, common formats and standards. We do what we can here. I think we've got a little ways to go to make things perfectly interoperable. And then really where we want to go is reusability. So if someone comes in outside of Spark, we'd love them to be able to pick up some of this data and make great things out of it, discover things that maybe we didn't know uh, were clearly there. So this is a lovely graphic. You can find that um, also here. That's uh, the graphic ID. But once you get a little bit into Spark, you understand that this is a very complex and diverse ecosystem. We have about 50 awards. The investigators are from over 80 institutions, and I did not believe that. I had to recount that again. There are various types of data having to do with physiology, having to do with microscopy, having to do with transcriptomics. Those are some of the major types. There are lots of flavors of these major types, and there are also some other minor types. 20 organs and all of the nervous connective tissue associated with those 20 organs is in this in the current data. Um, there are six species. And some of the data sets actually have over 10,000 files that are associated with each one. So being able to deal with this kind of diversity is going to give anyone a little bit of a headache. So um, I would just like to let you know that you know we have uh, been dealing with the Spark investigators and they have taught us many things. Thank you very much for teaching us many, many things, including things like experiments are in fact extraordinarily complicated and can be organized in many, many different ways. Some ways are much preferred by a particular lab member, but they may not be the best way to share that data with the, the broader community. Many file and file types can be gathered per subject members of the same lab may actually use completely different ways to arrange their data. Um, and there has always been difficulty in sharing data within a particular lab. And now you can broaden that out with a large scale project like Spark um, to imagine that this is actually not as simple as at first appears to be. So our members have also taught us that our templates are still insufficient to handle all cases of, of data where uh, data is to be shared. Some of the types of data are still not well served uh, by our template, data templates. And there are some ambiguities that continue to persist within our templates. So 2.0 will try to address some of those. So just to refresh your memory, and I know you all know this, so I'll go through it really fast. The 1.2.3 data structure, which we're currently on, um, has a set of required uh, data, and that's primarily in the primary folder. So this folder is absolutely required for all data sets. Um, there are uh, a bunch of optional folders, including code folders, derivative folders, documents folders, protocol and source folders. These are all, again, optional uh, currently. 
And uh, then there are these data set description files. So these are uh, four required files, including submission, uh, subject samples, and the data set description. A couple of optional files, and you all know about this, so I will not um, uh, you know, continue on this. There's a white paper. Now this uh, white paper has also been accepted for publication. So we will um, uh, set that up as soon as uh, that becomes available. Okay, so what's coming in September? These are uh, some release notes for version 2.0 of this uh, data structure. The major changes are that there will be additional requirements or, or added requirements for imaging metadata um, for microscopy. So many of you have already been working with MBF Biosciences, um, adding a lot of metadata into those files. And when you do that, you're largely already fulfilling these things that we will now make required um, with version 2.0. So it will not be a surprise to you. Uh, for those people who are not working with MBF Biosciences, there will be some additional tasks that you will need to do. Um, we will introduce uh, the concept of a unique subject and sample identifier. Um, that's something I'll, I'll show you in just a second. Um, and then, of course, there will be a modified structure for computational data. So we haven't really had a structure for computational data, but working with our colleagues at OSPARC, um, we have uh, come up with a, a data set structure that would work for them um, to describe computational type data sets. And so now you will be able to choose. You can either have uh, a, a computational data set or an experimental data set, and different kinds of fire, uh, files will be required for those. So there are a bunch of minor changes that you can look at here. Uh, generally speaking, um, we are making some of the currently optional files man mandatory, which includes the manifest files. Uh, we're going to rename a couple of columns just to make, uh, make them less confusing. Uh, we've heard from a lot of the investigators. Thank you for letting us know where things uh, need to be clarified. Uh, subjects and samples have um, optional columns that are more aligned with uh, the greater neuroscience community, including open minds from Europe, um, uh, Dandy, Nemo, and BCDC uh, from the US. Uh, so these are now much more similar to the data sets coming out of those uh, large projects. Um, we have removed also the description, and I'll get into this in a second, um, and uh, uh, added uh, and some uh, example rows from templates that was just causing some uh, heterogeneity. Uh, the documentation is available here and uh, the new templates uh, that support uh, these new these changes um, are available here in, in GitHub just like they were previously. Okay, so let's look at the kind of broad overview. Uh, you can see that the folders really are not different. So we still have a derivative folder, which is conditional. Um, we have protocol folder. These, these are all optional documents folder uh, and source folder. Um, code also conditional uh, if, if there is a, 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 a data set that is computational. Uh, it will require those. Um, if you look up here, uh, here are our standard um, uh, data set descriptions. Now we have some additional files and these, these uh, conditional files are essentially if there is a, um, uh, a code data set, then these two files will be uh, uh, required and the subjects and sample files will not be required for um, code type data sets. Whereas if you have an experimental data set, you will still have the subjects and the samples files. Um, everything else is largely staying the same. There are a couple of new files here. These are optional. You don't have to fill these out, um, but SODA will be able to generate some of these for you. Um, the primaries uh, folder will not change. You can see that this is um, essentially exactly the same. Uh, so really the big changes are for the computational data sets. Um, and let's dig into this a little bit more. So again, a little bit more uh, better descriptions of some of these folders 
but the top level folder structure is exactly what it was before. Um, and then here are the files and better description of those. So here uh, we'll see um, the subjects, samples. Uh, these are now conditional. They used to be required. Now they're conditional upon whether or not this is a, uh, a, a computational data set or not. The data set description has some additional um, fields that we will uh, we will use to actually determine whether this is a uh, this or that type of uh, data set. And then here are the code files. So these are the new uh, descriptive files for code. Um, and then here are the two descriptive files for the performance and the resources. Um, and these are again optional. Submission file is exactly the same. So now uh, digging into this a little bit more. So uh, the data set description file, you will look at it and say, oh, wow, that's really different. But in fact, it's really not. We try to make this a little bit more straightforward in terms of looking at um, these different kinds of things that we were asking for before, but grouping them into either basic information, study information, contributor information, et cetera. And the study information, really, this was the description. Um, and so now we have a new, whole new bunch of things here that you might say, oh, goodness gracious, what have they now done? But in fact, you know, we've already been doing this. So instead of having one blob for a description, you, you have seen this before, probably in all of your published data set, we have a study purpose. Right. We have a, a data collection, again, data collection, and a primary conclusion, and that's here. So these have just been kind of broken out from the single kind of blob of description into, um, you know, what we're now putting onto uh, the Spark.Science. And, um, you know, things like study organ system, we never asked for this. The curator came up with this themselves. Um, but if you would like to uh, fill that in, that might be better. Um, so this is where uh, the information will from you know uh, will will come from from this for these facets on the on the portal, uh, as and the technique uh, will soon hopefully get some nice facets on the portal as well. Now Soda and uh, Bavesh will tell you more about this in a, in a second. Uh, will actually surface some of these automatically. So. Um, you don't have to do a lot uh, more if you're working within the SODA tool, which we will very much encourage. Okay, looking at the data set description file. So uh, again, these are the new, uh, the new fields um, or slightly broken up uh, a little bit better. But what we have here is also this type, right? So this type uh, is going to be filled in as experimental, generally speaking. This is an experimental data set, but it can also be a computational data set. So this is where you would say that. So this is by default experimental. Um, and if it's a computational study, you would fill in computational here. Um, then here is the title, subtitle. These haven't changed. Um, we're trying to put in some view, visual cues. We're trying to, we made some of these um, fields gray that's uh, indicating that you should not be filling these in. Some people do, some people don't. So we just wanted to try to clarify this a little bit better um, with visual cues of places where we expect uh, the uh, investigators to fill in information and places where the investigators should not fill in information. Uh, one of the things I'd like to say is that um, the identifier, the, the DOI um, for a protocol will be required. So when you go to your protocols.io, you would need to get a DOI for that protocol so that you can cite it here and then submit for publication. Okay, so uh, the code description Excel file, you'll have to download this. This is only a small part of this. This is the 10 simple rules um, for, and again, working with our colleagues at OSPARC. Um, we've come up with a way to essentially codify these 10 simple rules for uh, for code. And what we're going to um, do is have the code um, uh, folders have these code description Excel files trying to essentially uh, clearly rate and reference uh, the uh, data and the, uh, the content of those. So there's an, an um, 
a guideline that is included about the uh, 10 simple rules here. Um, that's also linked in the, uh, in the uh, data set descriptions. Uh, the code RIDs and ontologies will be required and there is information about how to get all of those terms. Uh, metadata format will be based on the data set submission format. And uh, the solution really does encourage uh, creating validated, documented, and version controlled code without restricting submitters to doing something like on GitHub. Um, and yet it, it, it should achieve the same kind of goal. Okay. So the code parameters Excel file, again, uh, will deal with the data types, the data units and ontologies uh, where those are appropriate. Now, the thing about these is that we will continue to have open office hours um, in order to uh, make sure that your data set, when you're dealing with these new uh, data files, um, is is put in in an understandable way, and the uh, the great people at OSPARC will help you work through Alex. the first example or um, the first couple of examples so that Let's you can get used to these new files. Okay, the submission file has just one tiny change. Uh, and essentially, we've heard this from again multiple investigators. If a data set is not actually part of a particular milestone, you can now use NA here without throwing any errors. Um, now, just a quick reminder for everyone, every data set needs to be become public one year after the milestone completion date. Um, the only person that is able to publish the data set is the owner of that data set. So make sure that if your postdoc is uploading this data, um, and you are the PI, then please make sure that the PI becomes the owner of that data set um, on the platform as soon as possible. Um, and then only a request to publish a data set will actually initiate curation of that data set because we cannot know when you're done uploading files or adding information until you push that request to publish uh, button. Okay. So uh, now let me delve in a little bit into this. So here are two wonderful data sets, and these are absolutely beautiful data sets. And you can see that there's some, some similarities here. Potentially, these are the same or very similar subjects. But is subject one in this data set the same as subject one in this other data set or the sample? So uh, subjects and sample Excel files, you are familiar with these. These have a set of um, required fields in green here and optional fields in, uh, in, in yellow. And um, these are essentially the same as they were before. We, uh, we removed some of the examples here because these example rows um, were a little bit confusing to people. Um, the headings of these columns have been a little bit normalized, um, but these are largely the same. But let's look at where uh, some of the small, relatively small changes are. So um, uh, temple, uh, template 1.2.3 versus 2.0, there are a couple of additional required fields. So um, we are actually uh, adding into the data set, including the pensive IDs for any other data sets that have data about the same specimen. So if you say, in fact, when we go back a couple of slides here, that this data set and this data set are actually related, we're going to relate them by the pensive ID. And that way we can actually tell whether the set of uh, specimen IDs should or should not be the same. Right. So this add the member of, so this member of, and again, there's a, a description of this. This is for cases where we need to actually include a specimen in a particular population. So, um, you know, again, delving in a little bit more sample changes, member of for cases where we need to include a specimen in a population. Um, 
also in data sets. So there is another uh, uh, data set that also includes the same uh, identifier, so the same subjects or the same uh, the same samples in this case. Uh, now, many of you have already done, um, or you, many of you have already a system in the laboratory um, that already has an internal identifier. And then what we've done before is we've asked you to sometimes rename um, that particular or change that identifier a little bit to fit into the Spark data structure. Um, and then it becomes a little bit difficult to um, you know, to reconcile the laboratory identifier with the Spark data identifier. So we've added a field here. Um, this is optional. You don't need to use it. But if you have a laboratory internal identifier for a particular specimen, you can simply add it here. And that way you can see, uh, you know, based on either the lab ID or the kind of, you know, more standardized identifier for that sample or subject, um, you know, which particular uh, uh, sample this is. Okay. Alrighty. So looking again at, at the large overview here, we're going to look at things like sample IDs, and these are going to be numerical. So sample IDs must be unique for the data set. Uh, now we're going to check for that. IDs can include no special characters. So if you like the alpha mouse, I'm very sorry. <laughs> You're, you can put that alpha alpha mouse into um, the lab specific identifier field. These are going to be no special characters, no empty spaces, and only, you know, essential uh, characters zero through nine, A through Z, um, and hyphen dash characters are allowed, right? So essential, whoops, excuse me. All right, <laughs> going right back. Um, we have to have prefixes, subjects, and samples for all of these so that they can nicely add up together. Folder naming must actually reflect the exact subject and sample ID. That way we can tell that sample 3445 is the actually the sample 3445 here. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, now sample folders must be inside of the subject folders. Each data file must be listed in the main manifest with adequate description. And the nice thing about this is that manifest file will be generated and updated by SODA. So again, we're going to really strongly encourage you to use SODA because it in it allows that the creation, automated creation of that manifest file. Okay, thank you very much. All right, and after this presentation from uh, Anita, I will um, hand over to Babesh, who will speak about the uh, SODA tool, the tool uh, created by his uh, team and the tool that allows all of us stay calm and prepare and curate data sets. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Bhavesh, I'm a researcher at the California Medical Innovation Institute. Uh, my team and I are developing uh, SODA, which stands for a software to organize data automatically. Uh, SODA is an open source uh, desktop software uh, which is available for Windows, Mac, and Linux computers. It can be uh, easily downloaded uh, from our GitHub page uh, where you can get the version that's suitable for your computer. Uh, the goal of SODA is to simplify data curation and sharing for Spark researchers. Uh, as you saw today, it could be uh, overwhelming to navigate uh, through the Spark standards and the curation guidelines what we aim to do is to provide a tool that helps uh, you learn, understand, and implement these guidelines easily. Uh, uh, basically, we don't want the researcher to think about any of these. And if you have to think, uh, then we are probably doing something wrong. And uh, we try to achieve that through uh, three main aspects. So we centralize all the resources and information into a single interface. So we break down the curation process into logical and easy to perform steps. And uh, we also include automation whenever possible uh, to reduce your effort 
and at the same time, uh, reduce errors in the process. This next slide, I'm giving a quick overview of the software. Uh, so the front end of Soda, which is uh, what you see when you use the software, provides an intuitive and, and pleasant uh, interface that helps you navigate and accomplish all of the Spark uh, requirements, uh, which can be uh, roughly broken down into four main steps. Prepare the data set on Pentive, uh, create the data set, add a binary image, license, etc. cetera. Prepare the metadata files that applies to your data set, uh, including the submission, the data set description, which are mandatory, and uh, all others as applicable. Uh, organize easily your data files and metadata into the folder structure that's imposed by the SPS, and upload all of that onto Pensive, and finally sharing with the curation team uh, for review. Uh, and the back end of Soda is, is connected to various Spark resources uh, to help you in your journey of data curation. Some of them are uh, listed here. Uh, for instance, you can connect through Soda with your Pensive account and then accomplish all the requirements up there, uh, including uploading your file onto the platform. Uh, Soda is also linked to SiteCrunch and the NCDI taxonomy. Uh, so we help you using standard vocabulary for your metadata file. Uh, you can also connect your protocol IO account uh, and then we automatically grab the link or the DOI uh, that's applicable uh, for your uh, data set and include that into your metadata file. Next, I'm going to uh, quickly showcase uh, the actual interface of the software. And so basically this is the interface that you see. So when you use Soda, uh, you can access uh, the different the four major steps are mentioned through these tabs. Within each of this, uh, the uh, tabs, we have broken down the requirement into uh, individual steps that could be accessed uh, through each of these cards. Uh, for instance, our feature to create a new data set on Pensive can be done through this interface where we allow you to connect easily with your Pensive account. You only required once, then remembered by Soda and then quickly enter the name for your, for your data set to create the data set quickly. Uh, we also provide suggestion into the next step. So rather than navigating through those different cards and tabs, you can also follow our suggested workflow so you can do that easily. And within each of our interface, you would see two uh, where that provides some additional information when you hover over. So you can learn a little bit more about what you need to do and the requirement. If you really need more information, you can also click on our Need Help link. That would then open up the, the corresponding uh, page of our documentation uh, that on, not only provides you uh, help uh, to accomplish the step, uh, but also uh, give you a little bit of background so you can understand why you need to do that and give you some rationale of the Spark standards so you can learn a little bit along the way. So basically, again, we incorporate everything into this single interface. Of course, it's, uh, it's fun to click around. So I would suggest uh, all of you to, to give it a try and, and let us know how, how we can improve. Uh, what we are planning to do next, uh, we have several things in the pipeline to make it even easier and convenient for you. To, to comply with those Spark standards. And the first thing that we are doing is transitioning to SPS 2.0. We already started that, so then whenever they are uh, imposed, uh, uh, we would be ready for you. And also planning and working on integrating the validator developed by the curation team that they use to check your data automatically, and linking it and incorporating it uh, in Soda. Uh, which is very exciting because it will allow you to validate your data set before you submit them and address, detect any error and address them pro proactively. 
And currently, we are also reaching out to each of the Spark group uh, individually. So we can do a live demo, uh, discuss, learn a little bit uh, how we can improve further and help them more uh, making their curation work go more uh, efficient and, and easier. If you haven't heard back, uh, we'll probably uh, hear soon. We're looking forward to working with uh, everyone. That's all from my end. I'll, I'll hand back to, to Anna. Thank you, Babesh. I hope that uh, everyone who was not uh, using soda uh, yet was um, convinced that this is a very useful tool and it's really improving a workflow for preparing and curating the data sets for uh, Spark standards. Um, we um, you can you can find resources here um, for uh, currently available uh, templates and um, additional information and documentation about soda. I am also hosting uh, Zoom open uh, office hours for everyone who has uh, additional questions or need clarification. I would be more than happy to spend uh, time explaining in in-person details. And um, I think this is it, what we have for today. And we will take questions. It looks like Martin has a question for Bavesh in the chat. Martin, do you want to ask directly or would you like us to? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Hey, Bavesh, I've been using soda, um, um, uh, sort of half using soda uh, for its ability to create manifests, uh, which is really necessary in my case, just because our data sets are created so asynchronously, uh, being sort of data wrangler and having getting bits of the data set in, in different times. Uh, it's often really hard to be sure that, you know, and, and there's of course two interfaces now. So we've got Soda and we've got the, the Pensieve interface for creating a data set. So it'd be really great for Soda to be able to connect to an existing data set on Pensieve and to, uh, to be able to curate and edit an existing data set. Is that going to be possible? Hey, uh, yes, it's uh, currently possible. Let me just share my screen so I can that uh, we have an option now to, to for you to uh, modify and, and, and work on existing data sets. So if you go under our prepare data set uh, feature under organized data set, go back. So if you select here, continue working on an existing pending data set, and then select that data set among uh, the list of your data set and then continue working on it. I'm just selecting here one that I have that I used previously for another webinar. What we do is we pull out all the information and the files that are in that data set. You can then go work on them. You can add more files, rename files, uh, anything you'd like to do. And then when you generate that, uh, we create that uh, at the end of those uh, six, seven steps, and also adjust the manifest file automatically for you. That, that's awesome. I think um, that probably deals with a few uh, other questions I had because, of course, um, generally when you create a data set locally with Soda, it takes it copies all of the data from one place to another, uh, which for huge data sets is is very time consuming. Um, uh, and one of the reasons we tend to generate data sets locally is because uh, our, you know, um, network connections are not always, um, uh, you know, a great uh, and particularly because I'm in Australia and you can be halfway through an upload process and, and uh, leaving something and not know where you are. And, and if, it, if it fails, then, then it's very, um, uh, very difficult to work out what's uploaded, what's not. And it's a very manual process. 
So um, having been able to sort of um, do it bit by bit, or at least um, have a really good handle on where it's going is useful. So that's what generally why we generate data sets locally and then upload them. Um, like I said, these huge data sets can often uh, be, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very resource intensive to copy them one place to the other. Um, so one, one way to do this is to sort of upload manually and then, and then connect to the data set via soda. Uh, but, uh, another way would be to have soda, uh, add manifest files locally, but I think possibly the connecting to an existing data set would be a better way to go thinking on my feet. So that, that's really good. Thanks very much. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think the, the best way would be to create that data set on Pensive. And if you are working with several researchers, ask them to upload everything up there and then just work on it, organize it, and so on through, through Soda. And for, the, for creating it locally, uh, we make a copy rather than moving the file just to be careful about you know what we do with the original file and not modify them or or if, or lose them. You know, it's just as an issue. But we could have that uh, very easily. So if it's something that you need often, we could definitely have that option of say, moving the actual file locally rather than creating a copy. So yeah, just let me know if that's something that we could. Yeah, I, and I think so. Just because the you know sometimes creating the data set can be an asynchronous process over months, <laughs> and and so uh, you know you've got you you you're moving files already from their original locations into into the data set structure uh, as you receive them or as you um, as you find you need them, uh, or the you know you get them from the from the investigator. So. So a lot of the time we've done all that work already and, and we've, we've been careful to, to um, make sure the data is, is uh, in a place which is you know, secondary and, and not uh, uh, mod modifying the original data sets. So if we were have, able to have that option, that would be useful, I think. Yep, yeah, definitely. I, I've taken note of that and I'll, I'll follow up with you. Thanks very much. Yep, yeah, sure. So we have another question from uh, from Bartek. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. Uh, uh, yeah, it has been answered, but um, okay. uh, in in the chat. Uh, however, uh, I just wanted to sort of re restate it that uh, um, during the presentation, this one and the previous ones on the data curation, there are uh, many, many resources which are being presented. And, and I asked if there is any central repository where those resources could be found. And, and the answer was given that that if I just go to Spark Science Help, I can find it. But if I go to S S Spark Science Help and do a simple exercise of, for instance, typing soda in the search for resources, I got zero answers. So it tells me that there are uh, other places where this information is. And, and it would be nice to have just one place where one could, for instance, go and be linked to this uh, white paper, uh, which is on Google. Right or a link to the bioarchive where there is the last version of the white paper because mm -hmm. right now the resources are in multiple places and I actually have bookmarks to many of them <laughs> in my in, in my collection but um, I was on another computer the other day I wanted to show um, uh, something to a colleague of mine and you know without the bookmark I was I was unable to to find anything because it, you have to know where it is basically. So it would be nice to have one place where all of those great resources are linked to. Thank you. I agree, that's great feedback, yeah. thank you. In fact, uh, we are working on, I'm sorry, I was saying, uh, we're working on trying to improve the portal over the next year or so. And if you don't mind, we would love to have you as a use case for this particular, <laughs> uh, I know. <laughs> it, like, just get some feedback from you on like um, if the resources we're thinking about creating would be useful um, for your needs, and that's that's the goal, right? Is to make it easier to find things like this. So, that's great feedback. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other questions at this time? Um, just the 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 complex um, for the code. 
uh, the, the complex code requirements, would they apply to if you're just using a, a, a simple sort of uh, macro in image J or something like that? They're generally the things that we tend to put in our code uh, directory. It seems uh, a little overkill to, to have all of these extra uh, bells and whistles for something that simple. Are we going to be caught up in that, that requirement or is, that, uh, is there a fundamental reason why we should? This requirement will not um, apply to, you know, single line codes that you have only to print uh, a graph, right? Or uh, do something in image J. Um, we are talking about complex codes that cannot be executed without this additional information about the parameters used and, and all other stuff that is needed for the code to be fun functional for other researchers. Uh, wonderful, thank you. I think we have a question from Igor. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, I, I have a question. Um, my lab, uh, is is uh, working in the field of optical mapping with with voltage sensitive dyes, uh, mostly cardiac, um, and um, you know we've developed a code which is uh, now currently disseminated freely on GitHub, uh, and uh, many many labs are using it. But uh, basically, in this growing community, at least in the cardiac segment of it, uh, so I think it would be a good thing to consider uh, to provide such uh, open source code uh, to the whole community uh, and again we are happy to I mean it's just on github right now but I think it should be part of spark as well thank you I can take a quick shot at that one so that sounds like uh, a sort of ideal use case for um, for simcore um, they've been developing the o spark platform which is really designed to be able to run these analysis pipelines um, Right in a in a robust reproducible way that's accessible to anybody who wants to do that kind of data processing. So um, that that seems like something that they would absolutely be interested in working with you uh, about. Great, thank you. Could you just be listed at first on the on the Spark portal on the tools and resources at the start if it could be useful to with the tools and resources section on the Spark portal. So that, that's a question, I guess. Too. Oh, as a short as a short way to to make the um, the fact that there are these open analysis pipelines available to the community, listing them on the resources portal. Yes, that that would be another option. It's a good suggestion, Pavesh. Thank you. So Peregrine is question is what is the date for transitioning to the new standard? The date is uh, coming. We are aiming on the beginning of uh, September. And maybe I should add that uh, we will, uh, throughout the transition time, we will accept both templates. Uh, we're aiming to launch the new 2.0 uh, templates in September. And during the transition time, both of the templates, the old one and the new one will be accepted. So again, uh, we'd like to thank you for your time and uh, for listening and joining us today. And we are, we, we definitely uh, want your feedback. Like um, it said in the beginning of the presentation, you know, this is an evolution. Um, and we're trying to make changes to make it better and easier for everybody. But if we can get your feedback, that would help us do better uh, with that transition. And then also, as Anka pointed out, we have the curation open office hours still. And so hopefully you guys are taking advantage of those. And also, um, I believe there's a Slack curation channel too. Okay. So if there's nothing else, I guess we'd like to thank you and thank Anita who is here virtually and Anka and, um, and Babesh and Tom. Thank you all. <laughs>